So my name is Alan Stojanovic, um, and I'm a logaholic. I love collecting logs from anything I could possibly get my hands on, and uh, this particular place gives me that opportunity. I work at the University of Toronto, but I'm not part of the Citizen Lab. Uh, I consider the Citizen Lab actually one of my customers. I work in the core network. I deal with a lot of the, uh, the stuff that actually comes in and out of the gateways that would be the border to the university. Nothing I say here is to reflect their, them. These are all my own opinions, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I have some challenges. I have a really large network. I have a really large user base. Last count I saw was 141,000 and change paid employees. 80,000 uh, students that roll over approximately every five years. Several people outside the university, so on and so forth. Um, my network is mostly open. It's necessary, it's, it's a university network. We do lots and lots of research, we do lots and lots of sharing. Uh, we have... Um, a lot of different things in there. I have a motto that's become more of a mantra. Every make, every model, every vintage, every skill set. So if you can name it, chances are we have it. We have multiples of it and we have multiple versions of it. And what I really discovered when I started here, I've been here for three years now, is that you really don't know how much you rely upon certain things that you have everywhere else that suddenly you find missing. Because I have so many different things, I have networks that don't have certain things, like uh, let's call them firewalls. <laughs> Logs. Uh, because I got 29 slides, I'm going to run through quick, but here we go. Uh, Logs, you have them. Uh, you probably don't have all of them. Don't worry about it. The short answer is do what you can with what you got. Uh, I will never have all my logs. I can't get there. However, I look at what I've got, I try to flag anything that's unusual, and I search for things that cannot happen. One of my favorite statements from a developer is, that can never happen. That to me is a security assertion. That means I can say, that is an alert that I can set up and not worry about it because it can't never happen. If it happens, I know I've got something. Uh, tactical defense. I like to find tactical defense as the thing you do the moment that you've seen the action. I'm not talking about any kind of huge strategies here. I'm not going to give you silver bullets. These are not solutions that are actually going to solve all your problems, but they're actually going to tell you what's going on on your network, and that's kind of cool. The other thing that works really well is the larger your network, the more likely you are to get good results. So sometimes this will work in your network, some of these things won't. What I've got here is Six recipes for looking at logs that'll give you good information. Okay? I got logs. Uh, incidentally, I do not have a single meme in here. I didn't include any of them, but I did try to give them catchy names. Okay? So trial by firewall. Very simple idea here. If I've got a firewall up and that firewall is in front of a particular machine or a particular network and somebody touches a port on that firewall that I do not allow, why should I allow them to access ports that I do allow? So if they touch 3389 RDP, why should I let them go to port 80? So here's an experiment for you. Set up a firewall somewhere and block access to anybody that simply scans that firewall and log the fact that you've done it. Try that. With one IP address on my network, I was gathering between 60 and 100 IP addresses an hour. You thought I was going to say a day, didn't you? So this works tremendously well. This works even better in my particular network when I set this up on a, a firewall as if it was its own honeypot. I put it on a network on the side, but I do the block way over here on this other network that has no firewall. So I'm, put, I'm pumping an ACL out and then suddenly they're getting my protection over here and I don't have to change their network. So I don't get any of the political arguments over, you can't do that, you can't block me, you can't put stuff in front of me. Some of the actions I like to do. Now one of the things you gotta watch out for is whitelist 80 and 443, don't do it there unless you really, really don't like search engines. If you don't want search engines looking at your websites, hey, go for it, you'll block them out beautifully. Um, don't think about just denying uh, to, uh, to critical servers, deny to full networks, deny to the entire network. Uh, you know, have, uh, do the readings, but log everything you do. We'll get back to that. 
This one's my favorite. Dr. Bad Touch. Same concept, except more on the honeypot-ish kind of side. If you've got a web server that's listening on 80 and 443, how about setting up a couple of more ports? How about putting in 22 on the outside interface or 8080? 8080 is fun. And then if anybody touches one of those, block them. Oh. There we go, sorry. Now you can, you can block them from that particular server, you log that action, or maybe you go even farther, block them from your uh, critical infrastructure, block them from other machines, whatever. Um, anybody know artillery by any chance? So artillery is a, is a tool written by Trusted Sec that does exactly this. It's a Python script that listens on any ports that you define, you run it on a web server, it automatically sets up an IP tables block anytime anybody touches something. His is permanent. It blocks it until you choose to unblock. Again, 8443, but I like to alert on that if it's an internal IP address that's touched it and it's not already a web server. So that's my SMTP kind of stuff or whatnot. Now the other thing that I've noticed running this is uh, if you put a DNS entry on it, it's going to get probed a lot and very, very quickly. And not all of it is wrong. Not all of it is bad, so you got to kind of watch out there. I prefer to leave it unadvertised. Also, the attackers do figure out the IP real quick. So rotate the IP on a semi-regular basis. Blatant 404. Uh, you ever look at your web logs and you see all of these hits on all of these pages that don't even exist? Uh, like that top one there, the etc. password. Do you action that in any way? No. You say you look at that and you go, oh, it didn't work. I'm good. Well, the guy's just going to come back and do it again, right? He's going to do it with something else and he's going to try again. The one that caught me off guard was the uh, scans strict scans of my PHP admin, they go through and they check every vulnerable version to see whether it exists. And if it doesn't, they kind of disappear for a little while until the new vulnerability pops up and then they scan it again. Or they come back with something new. Um, the directory busting and hunting is something that's commonly done. I see that a lot. And uh, can scanners, they scan for everything. So again, you get a lot of 404 messages, lock them. Just lock them. Right there, don't even let them back get into your network. Uh, don't let them into the network, don't let them into the, uh, the web server, why not? Uh, pen testers hate me. Uh, now, index links, if you've already got links that are on uh, indexed in Google and people are clicking on that, that can cause some false positives if you do not have a good cycle for actually creating websites because, well, somebody creates up a website, they change it, a um, page has gone missing that it's indexed, now everybody's clicking on that and now you're actually blocking valid traffic. Be a little careful. The impossible multi-auth, another good one. So this one is basically around the idea that authentication servers log where you're logging in from. If you start actually correlating where people log in from, you start finding that anytime anybody logs in from multiple countries within, let's say, oh, eight minutes of each other, something's wrong. So maybe you should do something like reset the password, uh, block the account, any of a number of things. Um, be careful how you implement the time frame of what you're looking for because, well, at least in my population, I have a lot of traveling people. So I find if I try to, let's say, do a 12-hour time, time frame, it's completely possible to get from here to Venezuela in that period of time. So you gotta watch out for that kind of stuff. You also need an accurate GOIP database. I would actually suggest going as far as a subscription service on any of them to try to get that accuracy. They actually implant uh, bad data to see who's stealing it. So go to the subscription so you can actually get rid of that too. Um, actions, ticket it, flag it, reset it, whatever you can do automatically. Contact the user out of band. I have evidence that the attackers are actually changing filters on email boxes so that they're stay detected, uh, undetected longer. Um, and one of the things here is don't forget to tell them to change their password anywhere else they've used that same password, even if it's not one of your systems. So if they're using the password on your system and they're using it over on Gmail, tell them to go change that one too. And then, you know, maybe after that, you might want to have the conversation of why they shouldn't be the same in the first place. Uh, known local auth works really well in here, so if you actually do happen to have logs for your doors, uh, you can actually figure out, hey, this guy is on site. But as we learned today with some of the keys, uh, the, the door locks, that could be compromised. But you know what? If the guy's not actually in the city and you see local on site, you still know something's wrong. So deal with it. 
You get, get some good stuff going there. The questionable single source is another, one, another angle, same log data. If somebody's logging in, if you get multiple, multiple logins in a short period of time from the same IP address, whether they are successes or failures, somebody's trying to do something. I mean, these are obvious things, right? But nobody's actually actioning them that I could find. Um, so you find that you get a whole list of them. Uh, you can either tag them, reset them, or do whatever you feel is necessary to be able to clear that problem if it is a problem. Watch out for NAT, watch out for TOR, if you allow it at all, and watch out for proxies. Uh, the place that, the, the, the big one that I catch here is when people start signing up to other services uh, and some of the phishing attacks, but I got better for phishing. So here's some actions for the questionable single source. Oh yes, by the way, respect the privacy of your user. If you start going at them hard and saying, hey, I saw you log in from here, and then I saw you log in from here, they're gonna stop wanting giving you stuff. And sometimes you don't necessarily wanna know that your boss just logged in from his secretary's house. <laughs> That's my boss. Uh, fake phishing. So this one is actually an idea that my coworker came up with that, uh, pr that actually works better than I ever expected. Uh, we get the, f the phishing attacks just like everybody else. We get them in volume. We get non-targeted, we get targeted. We get every, again, make, every model, every vintage. What we started doing was we actually provided fake credentials to the fishers. We said, here, here's a user ID and a password, go log in. Uh, and they do. Now, what's been happening in the past is they take the entire list that they've fished, that they think they've successfully fished, and they will then try to log in as everybody to see what works. Quick story. I had one uh, group out of India that did exactly this. They sent a phishing attack. They tried to log in as everybody. Uh, I saw those logs. I reset all those passwords. Then I watched the Russians come back in and try to log in as all those same accounts, and nothing worked. What do you think happened next? That same Indian crew came back and started doing another fishing run, another campaign, a lot more sloppy, a lot more loud, and I don't know, maybe I'm over-imagining this, but I picture them having the gun of a Russian in the back of their head doing this work. Uh, you can also tag on other things. Sometimes your users are your best source, so scam and bullshit and other things that people will put likely into the username field is a great thing to trigger on if you haven't seen the phishing attack in the first place. Uh, this recipe does seem to have a limited lifespan. I can actually watch them changing their behavior as time goes on. They're trying to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, you change the credential you use, you change the IP space you use, you change when you reset them. So don't necessarily go in and reset them that moment that it's happened. Give it an hour and then reset them. So a bunch of other stuff. Also, deny the IP address that they came from. That's another really, really good one. It's also fun because then you can actually see what other IP addresses they control because they'll come back with the same list. Again, respect the privacy of the user themselves. Others. So that's kind of my big six. Those have been great. Uh, others that I'm looking into, NetFlow. Uh, I, my coworker has been doing a lot of work on NetFlow. He's got some really, really good stuff. I've yet to tie it together in a correlated way with some of this stuff, but I can already see, oh, it's, one, it's my first stop to find out if anybody's talking to a CNC, if anybody is uh, contacting any outside service or nefarious EARL or anything along those lines. Uh, Refer EARL has, uh, has some promise. I see lots of garbage coming in there on the few, and I mean few, websites that I have out of the several thousand in my network. Um, signal object HTTP. If somebody's loading only that one title GIF in your website, take a closer look because sometimes that site is actually, or that uh, image is actually being sourced from a site that's not yours but just pretending to be you. So that might be the start of the fish. Uh, DNS for all the normal reasons, email logs for all the normal reasons, robots.txt. This I took directly out of the book of offensive countermeasures. Uh, in your robots.txt file, put a directory that doesn't exist and then watch your logs. It's great when they come back and they say, hey, you got a directory here called secrets. I'm gonna grab this. And they try to touch that directory, it doesn't exist. You get a log, you block the IP, everybody's happy. Round two. Now you've been logging all of these actions that you've been doing. How about we look at the logs of logs and what can you can do with that? 
first thing that I started doing was aggregation. Because I'm dealing with such large networks and such, such huge spaces, I started actually looking at which IPs are the loudest, which ones never stop, and which ones can I tie together. If I start taking all of these IP addresses that have attacked me over time, as I block them, they start coming up in other IP addresses, can I start putting together contiguous IP space? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Now, these actors are a little bit different than most. They're not the average attacker. They're not the guys trying to make a quick buck, at least as far as I can tell. I don't know for sure. But all I know is that I found a slash 18 that, as far as I'm concerned, is completely weaponized, and I block the entire thing. I've never seen a successful uh, connect from them, so why would I allow them? Uh, incorrigible users. Uh, you know, you ever had that interview? Don't give your password to the tech, uh, to the help people. They don't need it. And their answer is, but you just asked for it this morning. It's like, Christ. So you've got these incorrigible users, or, and, and you don't necessarily know why they're getting compromised all the time. Maybe they keep falling for the phishing. Maybe they're, they just choose passwords, whatever it is. But you start seeing these things when you've got all the lists of the IDs that keep coming back, and you start having the ability to actually go talk to them in a friendly manner, be nice, so that you can actually try to figure out what the problem is and deal with it at the source. Hotspots. This goes for countries, this goes for shared IP space, this goes for a lot of little bits and pieces. The hotspot that popped up, pops up a lot for me is the open Wi-Fi, well, the paid for open Wi-Fi at the airport. Um, so anybody, anytime anybody's traveling, uh, if they hit an airport Wi-Fi, it's worth keeping an eye out f from my point of view because in a lot of cases I've got so many travelers that just statistically speaking, they leave their password behind. Now I'd like to be able to get to the point where I can actually say, okay, here's 1,800 people, let's put together some sort of uh, list of where they're all came in in common. And we've got the first round code for that, but what we're finding is, although it works great at a single IP layer, it doesn't work quite well enough at a kind of an area layer. So we're working on our next pass to say, here's an IP address, tell me everybody that's logged in from this radius around that IP, and then pick a, pick a random wild number. Again, requires really accurate GeoIP, we'll see how far we can get with that. Uh, again, deny, the, uh, deny access to critical systems, maybe for just that user. If you see a user get compromised, uh, or you see that hotspot, slow them down, confuse them, befuddle them, do whatever you have to do. And uh, your research and your sharing. Um, I can share, I'm in a university, uh, some of it is, uh, is considered proprietary and I gotta be a little bit careful, uh, but on the, on the slightly more open side, there's things I can share. But it, even those things I can't share, I can still research. So anyone else talking about the IP? What are they doing with it? What do they think of it? Has somebody already reported it? All of that kind of stuff. Also, this is kind of where you start thinking about things like Shodan, Shadow Server, and now Sonar that we, that we heard about earlier. Is that something you want to block? Maybe yes, maybe no. I personally will. Um, so let the results help you uh, to guide you uh, on what your final decision is. Round three, action and reaction. Uh, you're not allowed to deny. Your manager, your boss comes to you and says, don't you dare block traffic to our site. Well, there's other things that you can do. Uh, quarantine works tr tremendously well. Pick a period of time, quarantine them for that time, uh, and see what happens. If you can do this with an alert on the tail end and watch them pounding their head up against a wall, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, but if not, it, you know, it stops them for now, reduces the noise so you can see what's really going on. Because a lot of this is about that, reducing the noise. Redirect. Redirect is, can be super fun if you can implement it properly. It's a little bit difficult. Im uh, implement a redirect so that any time that uh, that IP comes back into your system, you redirect them into something safer. Maybe you got a clone of your website, and you know what you got now? You've got a volunteer pen tester. <laughs> and, since you, and if you're collecting all the logs off of that box properly, you don't even need his report. And that means you don't have to pay him. When you're working for a university that doesn't have very much budget in the first place, this works really well. Uh, when you start tying in things like IP tables, you can have even more fun. If you set up IP tables in masquerading mode on the inbound and redirect them there, it's completely transparent to them. So like for instance, if I see a touch on a port 22 on any of a number of critical boxes, I can redirect them to the port 22 kippo on my honeypot. 
And then it looks like I've got 11,000 and change machines, but they're all actually the same machine running Kippo. And then I can do some analysis from there. More to come on that, still playing with other things. Mod proxy is also a possibility. Even just a simple location tag in your HTTP server if you want to go that way. A number of different ways. Use your imagination. Uh, don't ignore your whitelists. Be able to whitelist anything. You're going to need it. Uh, the, you want to whitelist the things that you know are going to be touching these things, your own vulnerability server. Uh, any health monitoring you do, you just don't want to risk that stuff going down because you get the wrong people yelling at you, right, boss? <laughs> Maybe you actually uh, whitelist the, the actual, your boss's IP address as well, just to make absolutely certain that everything's clean. So when, he, when, the, when the boss's boss calls him, he goes, hey, it works for me. Uh, also, just because you're whitelisting it, keep alerting on it because it'll be useful later and keep logging that information. Uh, now this one, one for fun. I was playing with uh, HT access and putting in some extra rules into an Apache website. And I realized that uh, one of the things that I can do as a reaction to any of these people vis visiting me is I can make the entire website go away just for them. So I can actually make it so that if they touch the wrong thing, do the wrong thing or whatever, suddenly every page on that website is returning 404. If you're brave, do the opposite of this. Make it so that every page that they visit returns something. And there, there's an actual program called Web Labyrinth that does exactly that. Uh, it's actually, if you want to take it that far, it's designed to trap bad agents, bad search engines, so that it generates up a page with a whole bunch of random links. Each of those random links is clickable that generates up another page that goes, it just keeps recursing. When you throw certain scanners against that, they die from lack of memory. And poof, the website's gone. Magic. Uh, the after action action. <laughs> I, I couldn't come up. I was getting too tired. I couldn't come up with cool names anymore. Um, always be able to provide evidence. So somebody comes to you, in my particular situation, somebody comes to me, some researcher, and says, you blocked my traffic. You did this to me. And I can step into that room with reams of paper, but really only the front one matters, and say, on this date, at this time, you touched this port that you shouldn't have been on, and then you did these three things, and then this person from Vietnam decided to try to log in as you and succeeded. Yeah, I blocked your traffic. Usually they have nothing to say after that. Uh, be able to release the IP at a moment's notice, because sooner or later, somebody from high enough up is going to say, I don't care. Take me off that list. So take them off that list. But at that point, you can actually open the conversation if you're polite and professional and all this thing. So you can say things like, this is why you got blocked. This is going to happen again if you do it again. And then you do this. These are automated systems. I don't have any control. <laughs> do what you can with what you have where you are. Pretty straightforward. None of this is magic, but I don't, and I see a lot of people talking about it. I see a lot of people writing about it. I don't actually see a lot of people doing it. And I'm sure that you can come up with a hell of a lot more interesting recipes than I did here. Yeah? Do you see a significant amount of the same nonsense coming from all of those flag schemes that you own, or is the vast majority coming from the uh, loaded question, thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, my job is to protect the internet from our population, the population from our internet, and them from each other. I do not really differentiate. I try not to differentiate. Um, and I do not have exact numbers to back up that in any way. I concentrate a lot on the outside at this time because I'm actually much more interested in the threat intelligence side of things at the moment, but I will be getting into that. Sorry, not, I know it's not the answer you want, but that's the best one I'm going to give you. <laughs> anyone else? How are we doing for time? One minute. One question? One? Anyone? Cool. Thank you very much.